Ready. I've just had the thumbs up, and that means I can start. So let me introduce myself. I'm Paul Dobson, and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, thank you all for joining us on our fifth inaugural lecture of the autumn term. It's great to be here this evening. Welcome to the those of you who are joining us in the Thomas Paine Study Centre, and also to those of you joining via YouTube. Uh, and thank you for taking part if you're online, and please do let us know in the chat function where you're watching from. I'd also like to welcome our speaker this evening, Professor Jan LeBeau. Jan LeBeau is Professor of Higher Education Research in the School of Education and Lifelong Learning, EDU. He joined UEA as lecturer in 2007, following six years in London as researcher in the Center for Higher Education Research and Information of the Open University, and earlier positions at the Universities of Brest and Bordeaux in France and at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. From Nigeria, Yan developed strong collaborative ties with African social scientists becoming a regular collaborator of the Association of African Universities, the AAU, and of the Council for the Development of Social Science in Africa, CODESRIA, for their training programs on higher education research, um, and he's also been editor of uh, CODESRIA's Journal of Higher Education in Africa for six years, and regularly contributes to debates on decolonizing research methods across the continent. Jan's research brings comparative critical perspective and a qualitative dimension to studies of inequality of access to higher education, of international academic mobility, and of university governance from Africa to Latin America and the Middle East to Europe. His attention recently returned to the intersection of global and local trends in the formulation of policies with a new project on the UNESCO's Global Convention on higher education with colleagues from UEA. Today's presentation draws on personal research in Mexico, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia, and also gives voice to collaborators across the global south to question dominant interpretations and international policy agendas on the so-called long march towards universal higher education. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Jan Lebeau to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Paul, for these kind words. And thank you all for being here. Weather is dreadful outside. I know there's a football game tonight. So I'm competing with the World Cup, and I'm quite happy with what I've managed to achieve already. <laughs> tonight. So thank you very much and thank you colleagues and friends joining online from um, different parts of the world hopefully and uh, I hope you enjoy um, watching this from, from where you are. Um, as Paul was saying in his uh, introduction, I'm a qualitative researcher um, and um, as many qualitative researcher, I am secretly fascinated by numbers and by trends and by figures. But I can't really say it openly. I'm going to say it openly tonight. I like the shape of curves and I like the shape of graphs and what they mean. Like most social science scientists, I'm also fascinated by curves that you know, tell us something. There is a, a narrative that really develops when I see this curve heading towards somewhere. And this somewhere is quite higher over there. And there are a few bumps which will allow us to perhaps write one or two papers or, or investigate a little bit more. But overall, this is the reassuring trend of the long march toward higher education and participation. So this is basically a figure showing us where the world is coming from in terms of enrollment of students in higher education and where it's heading to. So if the world is heading to universal participation, whatever happens. What is the problem? The problem um, here is effectively that 
The United Nations themselves have set a target in 2015 as part of the um, social development goals of ensuring equal access for all women and men to affordable, quality, technical, vocational, and tertiary education, including university, and this to be achieved by 2030. I mean, this in itself is an acknowledgement probably that we are not yet there, and an acknowledgement that we are not gonna be there if we don't have policies that are driving us towards this agenda. So this is a call for action. This is also recognition that higher education that had been absent from the Millennium Goal and needed to be brought back as a key element of um, the social development of the world. So as higher education systems tend to grow around the world and tend to grow independently from other indicators of development in the global south in particular, and as the use of universities broaden and diversify, uh, the question of who should pay for and of who should benefit from the public good of higher education becomes a critical policy matter. I'm going to give you two or three definitions and a little bit of theory. So bear with me. This is all front-loaded so that we can then go on to um, discuss a little bit more what is actually happening. Um, the first of this definition, probably the most, uh, in fact, problematic, is the definition of higher education. Is there a common definition of higher education around the world? No, there isn't really. Yes, um, there is uh, something that um, all countries around the, the world refer to as higher beyond secondary education, but beyond that point, it becomes a little bit complex. So the UNESCO came up with the notion of tertiary education um, to refer to um, what is commonly understood as academic education, but also includes advanced vocational or professional education, and will uh, comprise all the levels five, six, seven, and eight, for those of you who are familiar with this uh, standard from the um, international uh, standard um, for um, education developed by the, by the UNESCO. So all these um, higher qualification are part of what the UNESCO defines broadly as tertiary education. The two terms tend to be used interchangeably. I'm probably going to use higher education much more during this presentation, but this is the broad field we are referring to. Anything beyond successful completion of higher education and accessible on condition of successful completion of secondary education. Second definition is that definition of the global south. For many, the global south is just the new <coughs> reference to the developing world. And to some extent, that is the case, except that the definition itself um, means more. The term global south, and I'm quoting here from uh, Dados and Connell, functions more as more than a metaphor for underdevelopment. It references an entire history of colonialism, neo-imperialism, and differential economic and social change through which large inequalities in living standards, life expectancy, and access to resources are maintained. The global south is this wide entity, whichever way we look at it, whichever perspective we adopt on it, um, which now um, incorporate countries of very different standard of living, very different levels of socioeconomic development, very different levels of achievement in terms of education participation at primary, secondary, and tertiary level. This is all within this um, Global South concept, but what remains is this relation to the past, this relation to a global system of power relation in which they are situated. The third definition that um, I would like us to consider tonight is the definition of how we're measuring access and participation in higher education. I will be using the term participation very often here. And when I mean, when I use the term participation, I actually refer to this indicator called the growth enrollment ratio, which is defined here as the number of students enrolled in higher education, regardless of age, expressed as a percentage of the population in the relevant year age group following on from the secondary school living age. <coughs> Complicated, 
basically that relevant age group is in most countries around the world the age bracket of 18 to 23, where one expects students to be enrolled in higher education. So we take the entire population of people in higher education on the, the relevant age group. And this allows to account for people who may have joined in higher education at a later stage, for instance. This figure has been used by UNESCO for decades. Um, it's also been used um, by all sorts of other institutions, and in particular, international organizations in their uh, policy recommendations and approach to higher education around the world. It's a tool that is less used these days, <clears throat> particularly in countries that have already reached high participation in higher education um, and where uh, probably more specific indicators allow to capture um, participation in higher education at, at various stages in people's life and so on. So this is not necessarily uh, the most accurate concept. It's also a concept that doesn't capture completion of higher education. So it captures participation at a given time, but doesn't tell us more much about um, completion rates, which are a different uh, tool altogether. So let's stick to this one so we don't have too many tools used. And finally, <clears throat> the conceptual framework that uh, we are going to not specifically use in the presentation, but to ref refer to quite a few times. This framework is borrowed from Martin Trow. Martin Trow is an American sociologist who, in the early 1970s, um, introduced a typology to account for the development of higher education systems in advanced societies, the terminology used by Martin Trow back then. Martin Trow wanted to effectively compare how higher education system had developed in the US and in Europe and try to understand why <coughs> um, those systems have taken slightly different directions and understand the commonalities between those systems, but also, perhaps more interestingly, understand those critical points of transition. When systems evolved, when and participation in higher education grows, uh, what is happening at those critical points? And he identified, as you can see in the three columns here, um, three stages in the development of all higher education systems of uh, those advanced uh, societies. First, they start from an, an elite um, stage where less than 15% of the age group, uh, using the growth and enrollment ratio, uh, are in higher education to a state of mass higher education where roughly between uh, 16 and 50 percent are in higher education and then that stage of universal uh, participation where more than 50 percent of an age cohort attends higher education. The critical approach and interesting approach uh, from uh, Martin Trow is actually how he has been able to connect various critical issues that are often observed in relation to higher education, issues of access, issues of curriculum diversification, issues of institutional characteristics and so on, and he's been able to relate them to those stages of development of higher education. Now, of course, Martin Trow never said that this was to become a global framework for understanding changes around the world. His intention his context, we were in 1973, was really focused on those countries um, that were, at the time, experiencing a dramatic growth of their enrollment. And those countries were primarily countries of Western Europe and uh, North America at the time. So this is for the framework. The framework becomes problematic because it's been used much more widely uh, by policy bodies in particular in understanding, in classifying, in ranking countries along a theoretical continuum for their achievements in terms of, wide, in terms of access and in terms of participation in higher education. So basically, this um, um, framework of analysis is now being used as a, as a policy tool and is being used to understand realities uh, that have nothing to do with the sort of fairly homogeneous world that Martin Trow was trying to understand through it. Okay, so um, in the next um, 
30 minutes or so, we are going to, I'm going to take you first of all through how applying this framework to the world um, is leading to different views of how we're getting, where we're getting with this move towards high participation before considering three dimensions of the framework that you've just seen, issues of access, of diversification of institution and of outcomes. And we will try to understand how in different, very different contexts of countries in the global south, these three dimensions accompanying the growth which we are observing pretty much everywhere actually express themselves in very different way and sometimes in contradictory way with the stage of development that these countries are supposed to be at. Back to the long march. And now we're going to begin to populate it a little bit. First of all, the time frame. That long march started at some point. And it effectively started in the early 1970s. Prior to the 1970s, the growth in enrollment in higher education is much more expressed in um, Western countries than anywhere else in the world. It's only from the 1960s and particularly with the uh, weight of independence and, and uh, um, developmental policies um, of the 1960s by international organization that we really begin to see a push, a sort of global push towards participation. So what we're seeing is that as well when we put a time frame on it that this uh, actually rise uh, towards uh, high participation. We are now reaching 40%. We are not yet there. We are still uh, within according to the classification you've just seen if we follow it in the sort of mass state. But anyway, um, we also see that this curve is actually starting slowly and it's really beginning to take a sharp uh, move towards the top from the 1990s. And we will come to this because this is largely due to developments in the global south. It's not been an easy route and it's not been a straightforward move. Many countries um, in the post-colonial context um, were under huge pressure to orientate their systems towards particular development imposed by um, international organizations and were facing a real, real dilemma between uh, trying to push people into their system and uh, managing their system in line with international expectation. Um, International expectations expressed in particular by the conditionalities of the World Bank and other financial organizations led to significant crisis in the 1980s and early 1990s under the um, conditionalities of structural adjustment programs in particular of the World Bank and the IMF, leading to mass exodus of, um, um, of um, academics from uh, countries of the global south to countries of the global north or countries of the global south to other countries of the global south um, and to forms of revolt and forms of uh, uprising in some universities well documented in this book for instance to the point that even international organizations started to question whether they had gone too far in this process and whether perhaps new approaches to supporting the development of higher education around the world had to be adopted that were less of a constraint on public resources, less of a constraint on the economies. And came up, of course, we are in a, the ideological context of ne uh, dominant neoliberal ideologies of the 1990s and early 2000. Um, and this led to marketized approach to the extension, to the expansion of HE system, the introduction to all sorts of procedures, including, as we can see, in um, countries such as the UK, where with the introduction of fees, the diversification of what universities were here to achieve led to a uh, situation sometimes of crisis and were never straightforward as a process. And this process led to where we are now. And um, I'm just going to remind um, allow us to remind ourselves for a minute of, of how <laughs> difficult. There have been very difficult choices to make. We could have made. I'm not showing on, on my screen, just uh, bear with me. Oh, 
Okay, thank you. Your decision to drastically cut the number of university students. We could have cut student maintenance. <laughs> have been very difficult choices to make. We could have made a decision to drastically cut the number of university students. We could have cut student maintenance. We could have cut the funding to universities without replacing it. But instead, we have opted for a set of policies that provides a strong base for university funding, which makes a major contribution to reducing the deficit and introducing a significantly more progressive system of graduate payments than we inherited. And I'm proud to put forward that measure to this House. Order. Order. Question A. Order. There is... Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> we could go on and on. Um, for those of you who were in the UK at the time, um, this was a critical debate. This was a critical turning point in the management of the expansion um, of higher education in the country. And um, as you can imagine, uh, similar debates uh, were about at the same time to take place um, in different parts of the world. And um, nowhere was the transition from mass higher education to universal higher education an easy, an easy route. Where are we now? We are, in terms of research, in those debates about the status of high participation system. And um, uh, Simon Marginson and, and other colleagues are uh, exploring um, the, the manifestations of, of these high uh, participation systems around the world. Because Martin Tro left us with that 50% um, mark where systems become so-called universal. What is happening between the 50% and the 100%? And this is where all these debates are taking place, all these challenges are taking place, and where perhaps new forms of inequalities are being to express themselves again within higher education system. So, coming back to our lovely chair, if we add um, the um, evolution of European countries at the same time in terms of their participation rate in AG, then all of a sudden our curve of the world becomes a little bit flatter. And what we see is immediately quite a sharp distance between the world evolution and the evolution in the context of Europe. If we add to this the uh, North American um, experience, um, then again, um, another totally different scenario is being shown. So even within those so-called advanced societies studied by um, Martin Trow, what we are seeing is that an evolution will have taken quite contrasting um, dimensions and much higher um, participation rates today in North America than in most European and continental European countries. Um, with some interesting ups and downs in the US context, often revealed by policies, for instance, fee policies in terms of access to colleges. If we now add to this Sub-Saharan Africa, we get another completely different picture with a fairly flat, at least in comparison with other parts of the world, um, evolution of participation rate, and so on and so forth. If I add to this uh, Asia and Latin America, and being to get quite a um, complex picture. A complex picture, but still a picture that shows America and Europe, basically the West, on top of it. And that's particularly the case because North America and Europe, in particular Europe, are fairly homogeneous in the evolution of their system. While if you take Latin America, for instance, or um, uh, East Asia, um, you have a blend of participation rates that are higher than they are in Europe and some other countries where participation rates are actually at the level found in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's what is producing those um, homogenizing trends, not really reflecting the reality. Let's look at specific countries of the so-called Global South, for instance, and what we see immediately is Chile up there. 90% participation rate in higher education, much higher than in the UK, for instance, and most continental European countries. Quite high as well, in fact, higher than in the UK, Saudi Arabia, uh, but not as high as Chile. 
even though Saudi Arabia has uh, more income than Chile. So here, not a perfect match between the level of income uh, of a country and participation in a key. And then going down, Mexico, India, two countries with huge challenges in terms of social inequalities, regional inequalities, despite having both excellence in their higher education institution, research institution that can be on par with some of the world best, and yet have participation rates in higher education struggling um, at the sort of world average. And going down to Nigeria and Mozambique, whose um, features and whose participation rate are more or less on par with those of Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, despite, again, certainly in the case of Nigeria, having a range of institutions um, that uh, produce excellent graduates that end up studying uh, in the University of East Anglia, for instance. So a complex picture of the so-called Global South emerging from the data here. Now from this, um, we um, are now going to consider our three domains that um, we, I said I was going to consider to uh, highlight challenges and paradox. The first one is the challenge of access. And here, I've identified three broad challenges in terms of access. The first one related to um, Inequal, unequal societies and how inequalities within societies, inequalities at lower levels of education, particularly primary and secondary, are challenging policies of access to higher education. A country can have all the best policies in place of affirmative action at higher education level if inequalities are deeply ingrained in system at, at, at lower level they will be replicated in access to HE. Second set of challenge, the challenge of unavailability, but we will come back to this in a minute. Let's hear about the situation um, in Mexico if to we start with. see the following graph, we can appreciate that the opportunities for the lowest and highest levels of income to complete their school trajectories in Mexico is very different. Only less than 10% of those who belong to the lowest income group have the opportunity to enter higher level education, while more than six times of the group of the highest income, the creation of new campuses of existing higher education institutions and public and private institutions in marginalized populations have opened new opportunities for people to access higher education, but the diversity in the quality and supply of higher education maintains or could even be thought to increase inequalities. So across social groups, Mexico is already f almost reflecting the diversity of the entire global south in terms of inequalities of access to higher education. Second problem of access is the problem of institutional culture and the problem of policy access themselves. So um, demand can rise from high participation in secondary education, but when people reach the level where they will want to enter into higher education, many systems around the world are not prepared to accommodate those new demands, are not equipped to accommodate them, or simply are not interested um, when uh, it comes to institutional culture. This is the case of Nigeria. Imagine that to have a shot at ever going to university, you would have to write a national entrance exam, go through multiple forms of screening, and possibly another exam at your chosen university if you passed. But first, you might need to wake up every day for several weeks to go join a massive and dangerous queue of thousands of others like you at a registration center, and then at a bank, and then at a computer-based center, sometimes as early as 6 a.m. every morning to get a chance at obtaining the clearance that you need to even take that national exam in the first place. And mind you, you would have to pay heavily for it. It's quite expensive. It's not free. And there is still no guarantee that you might either get the clearance by the registration deadline or get correct and timely information about where and when to take the exam and so might still miss it after all. Worse, if you were living in a rural area or have a disability or, God forbid, are a woman applicant with social and religious restrictions on your movement, or even worse, you are all of this intersectionality. 
Now, these are the experiences of many young people I spoke with during my research on higher education access in Nigeria. This situation of Nigeria um, needs to be put in relation to the participation rate for Nigeria. I've just said earlier on that Nigeria has a, an overall participation rate of about 10% of an age group in higher education. Now think of the number of people who are stuck at the entrance of the system, unable to participate uh, just because the system is not set up for them to enter, even though they have the right qualification to do so. Now moving on to Chile, where we've seen earlier on that the participation rate is reaching 90%, and therefore those questions of the um, issues of access are probably I have probably found some sort of response. Let's Chile see is um, a small country in South America, and although we have uh, at around uh, 19 million people here, um, 1.2 students million students are in, in, in the system, in higher education system. I would say that there are two important characteristics regarding higher education system in Chile. The first one is that it's a very privatized system with only 18 public universities and around 42 private universities. That means that most students are in private universities. And the second important characteristic is that the stratification of the system. That means that very few um, universities, about four or five, are research-oriented universities, while the rest are teaching-oriented universities. And most, um, uh, the, most of the, the poorest students go to teaching-oriented universities. Two challenges here in the context of Chile that are worth noting. First of all, expansion of the system has taken place primarily through the private sector and therefore through the fee-paying sector, on which um, I should add here that um, the public sector itself has become fee-paying at some point, leading to the demonstration and social movements that we have seen taking place between 2011 and 2013 in the country. Um, this figure is uh, comparing the, the global south and the global north and is showing us how um, the expansion of systems has taken place in terms of expansion of the number of institutions and what we are immediately seeing here uh, for the global south is that the expansion has taken place primarily in the private sector in terms of number of institutions. In some countries such as Chile, such as um, um, Brazil for instance, this expansion of the private sector has been so important that it has taken over the public sector in terms of being the prime um, space for delivering higher education. Elsewhere, that's not so much the case, and this is the reason why. Across the global south, the real expansion in student number has actually taken place within public institutions. So a large number of private institutions has developed but not necessarily absorbing the population. So the impact of the private sector introduction, um, often under pressure of uh, international organization, has not necessarily materialized in terms of providing real opportunities for higher education. Hence, situations such as uh, the case of Nigeria that we'll come back to in a minute. Um, let's have a look at the context of India, for instance, where um, opening up through institutional diversification has yet to really resolve um, some critical issues uh, regarding participation in the system. Even though barriers to entry have reduced, new forms of disparities have emerged in this massifying stage. These disparities include regional disparities in higher education access, social disparities in access patterns, such as those related to choice of subjects and disparities in learning outcomes. Moreover, due to gender conservatism, women's choice of subjects is largely influenced by differences in educational investment by families, distance to college, and safety within higher education institutions. Importantly, disparities in learning outcomes are influenced by a new form of tension developing between massification and student diversity on campuses. The social composition of student intake has changed, but institutions remain less sensitive to these changes 
with support mechanisms to address student diversity poorly developed. As of so the issue um, raised here by Nidhi is that of how the diversification of higher education system, particularly in the global south, in absence of strong policies of supporting this um, new population accessing, accessing higher education, has actually effectively contributed to more disparities in terms of learning outcome with the poorest students attending local universities or local institution or cheap private higher education institution and not obviously benefiting from the same quality of teaching. We will come back to this point. But once again, let's focus on this question of uh, privatization and how the private sector has or hasn't contributed to alleviating the pressure on public As of today, there are about two 119 registered universities, 49 are federal universities, 59 of them are state owned, and 111 are private universities. So, even with this liberalization of higher education provision, private universities in Nigeria have only been able to enroll just about 6% of admission seekers. Uh, apart from the fact that this pseudo expansion has exacerbated educational inequalities between the regions of the South and the North. It has also made most public universities in the South, in particular, overloaded with large classes. Academics in my study, for instance, reflected on the challenges of meeting the needs of students with disabilities in a class of about 2,500 students. Support staff are also saying that their effort to transform the university culture to be inclusive is being met with a lack of human and material resources. These challenges of, um, of inclusion in public universities as a result of the private sector not effectively contributing to alleviating pressure, as you can see, are shared across the global south by quite a number of countries. And may be expressed in countries with very unequal levels of participation in higher education. So again, here, a mismatch between what is expected to happen at a given level of the process towards massification and, 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 um, and uh, universalization of higher education and the challenges that are effectively encountered in this process. Moving on to Mozambique, uh, we're going we're continuing our tour of the collaborators I've been researching all these issues with over the years. And um, we are now beginning to touch on something that is also a consequence of the process of diversification and, and deregulation of the sector. And this is more to do with the learning outcomes, what it is that teaching and learning, that uh, students are learning, and what is the quality of what is being taught in those circumstances. In most African countries, including Mozambique, if you look at what's actually happening, uh, you, we, we may question whether the notion of massification as we know it from the literature actually applies. However, we see some institutions, especially the flagship institutions, um, overcrowded. Uh, so many people wanting to join these uh, prestigious institutions and therefore, another phenomenon takes place there, uh, which I call qualified mediocrity. And that is also a side effect, is a result of the conditions under which those institutions operate. So, that so if universities are under such pressures, particularly uh, public universities, and particularly as uh, Patricio was um, alluding to here, the flagship universities, those universities which in many parts of the global south were established either during the colonial era or in days when uh, money was flowing into the system. So if these universities continue to be attracting those um, large numbers of students with the rest of the sector barely competing in terms of um, reputation, then um, what will be the outcomes of what is being learned? If what is learned um, is not up to the expected standard, what will be um, the opportunities for graduates from those universities um, in, the, um, um, in the society? And perhaps more importantly, if higher education systems have developed independently 
from the rest of the countries, independently from the state of the economy for all sorts of reasons. What will be the match between graduates joining the labor market and the needs of the economy locally? These are the challenges that we are now looking at as the, as the, the last point of this presentation, um, the inequalities uh, of outcomes. And um, I've grouped them into two sets. The first one is this problem of the uh, transition to graduate employment, and here um, I'm referring to a um, optimistic quote from the World Bank talking about the, and we know um, that the private returns on, on, on higher education are high, and the World Bank has always insisted on those in order to support um, higher education policies around the world. And mentioned here that these high returns are even greater in sub-Saharan Africa at an estimated 21% increase in earning for tertiary education graduates. That is, if you are in a job. And the problem with um, um, the, world, the, the labor market for graduates in, in many sub-Saharan African countries is actually to access it, not to, once people are in it, they certainly earn more than they would if they were not qualified. But what we're seeing from other studies is that in many countries, including uh, three uh, case studies that I recently worked on with Ibrahim uh, Oranda, um, secondary school leavers, um, five years after completing, uh, have better chance of joining the labor market than higher education graduates. The, this is um, a situation of mismatch that is characterizing quite a, a number of, uh, of countries. And the responses to this crisis of mismatch have always been to put more pressure on institutions, on universities, to make their graduates more employable, you know, using frameworks that have been working elsewhere in the world without necessarily considering that perhaps the problem comes also from the labor market and its structure. Second set of, learn of um, inequality of outcome, obviously, um, refers here to um, the fact that outside universities, outside a uh, higher education system, a number of factors continue to affect the uh, possibility of accessing um, decent jobs and inequalities are expressing themselves again in the wider society. Um, here we see the example of uh, Chile and Peru um, and also uh, considering Saudi Arabia where we are going to turn our attention for a minute now as the concluding uh, discussion of this, uh, of this presentation uh, where uh, women, um, and this is an interesting paradox, the um, participation of, uh, of women in higher education in Saudi Arabia is higher than um, the participation of men. So the percentage of women in higher education is higher than the percentage of men in higher education. However, their contribution to the labor market remains problematic. And we will then conclude with a little view on... Um, Saudi society is a young community with 44% of the population youth of both gender. Half of the female citizens are less than 27 years old according to the Saudi General Authority for Statistics. Women are engaged in high-level education and health sectors, while their engagement in the economic and organizational se sectors still low. Saudi Arabia is not the only country in this scenario. The Middle East and North Africa, MENA areas, continues to have low and static rates of female labor force participation. Despite the gender gap in schooling quickly narrowing, if not really turning around, the MENA paradox is the name given to this phenomenon. So this particular um, inequality of outcome, low participation of women um, in um, the, uh, the economy, um, even though they have a much higher participation in higher, co in, in, in higher education, as we as I suggested earlier, is um, the result of a combination of factors. Some of those factors may have to do with social norms in terms of women participating in, in the economy, and others uh, have to do with the changing nature of the economy. Women traditionally in the Middle East have participated um, in the labor uh, market in uh, the public sector, teaching um, positions, working in hospitals, etc. As the labor market in the public sector uh, started to, uh, to, to shrink, as it did almost everywhere in the world, 
they were not able to access in the same way position in the private sector for all sorts of other reasons coming into play. And this is likely to take time. This is a transition that most of the governments of the Middle East are working on as it's beginning to pose huge problem in terms of uh, the availability of, of qualification. And um, last point um, that I wanted to, um, to touch on very briefly relates to so would you um, the um, inequality of outcome for those who've been studying abroad and who are returning to their country and trying to find a job in their country. Now, we are going to look at a very, very specific paradox, a paradox that do, do not, does not really apply to many countries around the world, but applies in a spectacular way to the context of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is one of those countries that have seen participation in higher education exploding from the 1990s, late 1990s. So contrary to many countries of the global south, the real start in terms of mass higher education started closer to the 2000s in the context. And this was a policy-driven phenomenon, contrary to situations such as Nigeria, where policy has played catch-up with social demand. Policy here is driving the process ahead of social demand, and policy has driven and supported social demand. One of the ways um, that the expansion of the system had to rely on was uh, to send many graduates abroad to get uh, trained um, and uh, in order to then populate uh, not only qualified jobs in the economy more broadly, but also to populate universities that were being built at the same time. So at the same time as graduates were sent abroad uh, to get higher qualification, universities were built um, in the country, and those graduates returning very often from very prestigious universities, primarily in the US and then later on in Europe um, and the rest of the world. We've had uh, quite a few uh, in, uh, in UEA, for instance. Returning to their country had to occupy position within these universities newly created that were so desperate for uh, qualified labor. In Saudi Arabia context, public universities have increased from seven public university in 1990 to 29 university until now. The rise of the number of university that lead to a rise uh, in the number of leadership position, and that have to be covered by the Saudi uh, national uh, only, as mentioned by the Higher Education uh, Council. And the, the, the shortage of the Saudi academics in the uh, Saudi university, this is allowed to, to the uh, new graduated from the uh, abroad to take uh, this position. And uh, this position uh, impact in uh, their research activity and academic identity and uh, future uh, career. OK, so this little tour of the Global South um, is now taking us to um, my concluding slides. Um, and I'm just highlighting here, um, based on um, some of the paradoxes and challenges that I've just highlighted, um, some of the reason why I think um, policies need to change and to change urgently to support the development of um, higher education in the global south. And first, chief of all these uh, changes required, a change of perception, a change in the conceptualization um, that uh, we have of how higher education system evolved and, and whether they should all evolve in the same direction and whether this is actually happening for all system as some of the um, earlier global trends are suggesting. Um, another uh, set of factors that um, are um, you know, in need of change um, are related to the ideological orientation of uh, reforms imposed on the poorest country. Those pressures put on public resources um, have produced highly unequal higher education system. We've seen some examples here of system having expanded considerably, but building up and continuously building up inequalities within the system, which will then continue to, to reproduce themselves within, within uh, the society. This um, has pressure put on um, any public policies to try to tackle those inequalities has to stop, has to be reversed. Um, and um, 
more decisive political interventions have to, to take place to tackle those, uh, those inequalities, and particularly those building up right from primary and secondary education. As I've suggested earlier, and have st as studies have continuously shown, um, those inequalities building in the primary and secondary levels of education will continue to affect primary participation, whatever policies are being put in place um, at the level of entry. And we're returning to this target 4.3 of the SDGs here. This target obviously is not gonna be reached by 2030 from the data that I've shared, just shared with you in many parts of the world. And it will certainly not uh, be achieved without the provision of locally relevant, of quality, free of charge, undergraduate tertiary education. Ch is change on its way a little bit? We've seen signs already. Uh, an encouraging sign is that higher education cooperation and higher education mobility are developing across the global south and not only from the south to the north for mobility and the north to the south for policy bor borrowing. Um, we also see uh, more and more countries in the global north as in the global south rethinking funding mechanisms away from fees loan approaches or challenging the fee loans policy that they had implemented 10 years ago. Think South Africa, Chile, Germany, etc. Um, the risk of growing inequalities has become a major concern. Um, it is um, a concern for international organizations. It's clearly expressed by the World Bank, including the World Bank, now referring more um, openly to uh, the importance of the public good in any consideration of further development of higher education. So I wanted to finish on that more positive note. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, take some questions in a minute, but I, I just want to show my appreciation uh, for Jan and something um, I've benefited by working with Jan and colleagues from his school. It's a school of education and lifelong learning, and I think that that lifelong learning element is something which can't be forgotten about and underplayed. In this country, we're increasingly seeing higher education referring basically to 18 to 21-year-olds, and that can't be right. I mean, we as an economy and other economies around the world need lifelong learning and education. And the challenge with higher education is how to define what its value is in different societies. And what Jan has shown this evening, the complex situation across different countries, even measured in participation rates and what that means. Um, I think that what it brings to us though is a reminder, um, should we ever forget it, that paths are there but they're also made to be broken. And so while we might see that very nice snaking uh, movement up, we should never un underestimate the possibility that there could be severe disruption to that. Um, countries which, for one reason or another, might find themselves in a situation where higher education collapses. One only has to think of the situation in Ukraine at the moment as an example of that. Um, and just like that financial services uh, advertisement, the past isn't always a good predictor of the future. And I think that's so true as we look at higher education because it is challenged around the world in establishing what its value is and how much governments should support, invest and devise policies to promote participation in higher education. And in some sense, it's under a challenge to demonstrate what value it brings to societies, that it is a merit good it is great in its own worth and provides us with societal skills and insights that we can all benefit from. So thank you very much, Jan, for sharing your uh, research with your, and also uh, citing your colleagues as well. Can we just show our appreciation to Jan once more, please? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, somebody hopefully has a microphone somewhere. Does, uh, yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do I have any questions from the audience, please? And don't be shy, so come on. 
And uh, just so you know, if I get prompts from any from uh, YouTube, we'll pick those up as well, yeah? Okay, uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah, over there, please. Thank you, Jan. Uh, that was a new area for me. I enjoyed that very much. A couple of questions. One, can you just sort of confirm or correct for me, when you talk about universal, you mean over 50%. Is that, is that the case? Just to, cause I've got that right. So then, but my next point coming out of that then is, where, does, where do individuals' choices figure in all this and young people's choices? We talk a lot about children having rights to choose and so on. Um, Sometimes we see young people and we might think, oh, you're making the wrong choice, but they still make it. Um, how, how is that sort of that concept, uh, that, that element of participation woven into the idea of participation in tertiary education? Thanks. Thank you. Good question on, uh, on, on choices. So first of all, yes, you're right. Uh, um, universal participation is anything from 50% um, and above. I mean, that's in Martin Trow's typology. We can, of course, discuss that, what universal means when it's only 50% on a, of an age group. Um, choice, yes, choice operates at every single level. Choice is in part determined by a number of factors, as we know, uh, such as, for instance, the family background um, and uh, the impact, for instance, of, of guidance within secondary education is having a tremendous <coughs> Uh, influence over over choices, but choices of individuals operate at every single level. Choices can be actually encouraged by policy, pushed by policy, for instance in the UK context where the model of funding of higher education actually rests on choices made by the students. They go to one in university or another and they carry their fees with them and therefore choice becomes an instrument of putting institutions in competition against each other. So choice can be, can be really supported and actually even determined sometimes by policy, but it operates at every single level. It's becoming quite interesting to study, probably much more interesting to study across the global south because of the diversification of system. And then you have all these sorts of institution and, and you begin to look at, okay, why is it that people orientate themselves toward one type of institution or another? And as colleagues, particularly our colleague from India was showing, uh, choice can be constrained by all sorts of things, including issues of safety. Is it safe to attend higher education? It is not. In many parts of the world, going to university poses certain risk, etc. So those factors will enter in the choice that people are making. Thank you. Next question, please. I think it's a simultaneous hand raise. <laughs> I'll bring you down next. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, and thanks very much, Jan. I probably missed that bit because I entered a bit later. Um, what's your uh, position, what's your take on convergence? Um, is this something that uh, is desirable or to be promoted? Or is this the flip side of globalization? I think there are two dimensions to, com to convergence that are super important in understanding the evolution of, uh, of systems, of higher education systems. One is the convergence resulting from policy influence. And this is probably the convergence that has had the most impact um, globally on the state of higher education system, for instance, in the 1990s, when international organizations were able to dictate an agenda for development of HE over countries. So this led to a phenomenon of, of, conver of convergence and their constraints borrowing of policies. And another dimension of the convergence is, an, is more inherent to higher education and has often been underestimated by policy. And this is the fact that higher education around the world, right from the Middle Age, for instance, in the case of Europe, has always developed through the diffusion of ideas and people, Ex mobility, for instance, international mobility, has always been part of higher education. And the process of con convergence, the pro process of something we sometimes call isomorphism in the structure of universities around the world, is also the result of those phenomena that are more 
inherent to higher education systems. So it depends on, 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 on what stage of convergence you are considering, whether you're considering convergence as a policy process resulting from influence, external influence in this case, and in that case, yes, this is a process that is really problematic, I think. Okay, thanks. There was a question down here at the front and then uh, in the middle afterwards. Down here. Keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Jan. That was uh, fascinating. And um, I, I have a comment, really, which is um, perhaps sort of trending into a question. And, 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 and that is, uh, throughout your presentation, which was really fascinating, I couldn't, I found myself frequently thinking of um, that uh, statement of Michael Gove about seven years ago, you know, that people are, what was it, people are fed up with experts. And so globally we're seeing the sort of expertization of, of economies and, you know, there's global clamour for higher education. And that notion that of, of people being weary of experts and expertise, we're still living it with it today, it's reverberated through and we've seen some of the political uh, fallout from that. Um, with uh, Brexit and also through the COVID pandemic resistance to what seems you know, obvious in terms of therapies and vaccination and so on. So that's my comment. I suppose my question is, um, in, 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 in your research, have you found um, in, in similar parallels perhaps where in other parts of the world where, uh, is, is it unique to the UK it, or have you heard similar um, expressions and manifestations of that. And I suppose I'm thinking of p populism in its broadest sense. Does, mm. does that make sense, that question? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Have you what, seen that? Uh, perhaps what's um, very different um, in the context of the Global South is that, um, yes, the experts have been dominating the scene um, and other forms of discourses on higher education and higher education system have always existed in parallel to the discourse of experts. The problem is the discourse of experts have been dominant when it was coming from particularly policy organization, international policy organization that have sponsored research on higher education across the global south for three decades. Most of the research on higher education development in the global south has effectively been funded by the World Bank over three decades. So it is this expertise that has, had, that has dominated discourses until about 10 years ago. The colleagues you've just heard, they are experts, they are researchers who um, often using qualitative methods have continued to develop research in their own country and are now voicing uh, you know, their sort of opposition to some of the dominant discourses about uh, the state of higher education across the global south. And I think what's welcome here is that expertise is actually changing hand and we are now getting a lot more expertise and a not, lot more knowledge coming from the Global South and coming from different sources of expertise. So they are challenging the dominant discourse of, of the experts, I think. That's what I would say in relation to the Global South in particular. Okay, thank you. There's a question there. Thank you, and that, that was very interesting. My question is around quality. Because if you're going to look, look at the SDGs, it's not just about mass higher education. It has to be quality higher education. And so I'm wondering whether there is an argument here to be made about our frameworks of quality, like what counts as quality higher education? Where do these frameworks come from? So in the Philippines, for instance, we have ISOs, for instance, or our accreditation systems are modeled from the US, for example. And now there's very strong um, use of global rankings, almost like a proxy to quality in higher education. So I wondered whether you can comment on that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I can only agree with you on um, how um, ranking and uh, league tables have been used as a proxy for quality. Uh, this is obvious uh, 
particularly when it comes to funding um, the expansion and the development or innovation in higher education system. This is um, impacting on how countries adopt, for instance, um, policies and, and institutional collaborations from other countries, etc. So at every level, we see those uh, mechanisms taking place. So this is really problematic because quality is totally detached from the realities in which uh, systems are being built. And the, the, the conceptualization of quality uh, becomes a totally alien concept in, in many cases. And this is, um, you know, joining again other elements of this uh, problematic global and, and homogenizing um, perspective on higher education that we are seeing here. Okay, thank you. There was uh, two questions. There's one there and one at the back as well afterwards. If you want to go there. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk, Jan. It was fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, with regard to Tro's typology, if there could be um, another dimension added to it, which is the, the degree to which um, universities are independent. In particular, the degree to which they're able to teach the courses that they want to teach without there being economic constraints or direct political constraints or direct constraint from relig relig <coughs> religious authorities. Um, I'm not suggesting necessarily that in the global north um, academics are completely free um, because I don't think they are um, given the kind of economic constraints that, that universities labour under. But nevertheless um, in other countries such as perhaps Saudi Arabia, for example, the constraints are perhaps uh, much more um, obvious. So I just wondered if you had a thoughts about that. Well, um, I have a paper on that topic, uh, which is a paper about the governance of Saudi uh, universities and how the model of governance that they've imported from the US, because the Saudi are a very interesting example of a deliberate policy borrowing. So the state and, and the governance of institutions in Saudi Arabia is not one that's been imposed by the World Bank or whatever. It was a deliberate choice by the country to borrow the best from other parts of the world, including their quality framework, to impose that on the structure of the new universities they were creating and retrospectively on the universities, the few universities that were already there before the, the, the big move of the, of the 2000s. And uh, so um, this is a context where um, governance um, may have structures that are quite autonomous and, def and they begin to have those autom autonomous structures, for instance, in the, in the context of Saudi Arabia. But of course, Saudi universities operate in contrasting urban environment, Jeddah, uh, Riyadh, uh, some smaller towns in, in the north uh, or in the center, such as the University of Hail, where uh, Habab is working, for instance. And, and these sort of fairly autonomous structures of management of higher education now encounter uh, cultural practices on the relationship between individuals, between the rector and uh, the PVC, between the PVC and the head of school, and all these mechanisms of relationship that that develop outside in the Saudi society are beginning to reproduce themselves inside. So the governance structure adopted by a country do not necessarily reflect the actual level of autonomy that academics have within the institution because these are not entirely just um, related to um, the governance structure. In the Martin Tro typology, uh, what you've seen in that table is a summary of that uh, typology. Martin Tro had actually uh, a discussion of governance structure and the level of autonomy, which he saw as one of the markers of the development towards uh, universal higher education. So along the way, um, institutions become more and more autonomous in terms of designing their curriculum, inter but they also become more and more dependent to other factors external to the system, such as, for instance, the requirements of the labor market or the requirements of a much more competitive environment, for instance. Okay, we've got time for one brief question. There was one, somebody over there put their hand up earlier, or, okay, so do you want to take the last question? 
Well, as you know, Jan, I'm not, not an expert in this area, but I nevertheless found that fascinating, both wide-ranging and very detailed, which is quite a trick to pull off. Um, I was very struck by the example of Chile, which has a very high proportion of teaching universities as uh, compared with um, research-based universities. And I wondered, is that model valuable? Is it exportable? Um, how, how, how is it... How do they deal with that issue in Chile? And are any other countries interested in that sort of model? This is certainly a model that has been promoted at some point by international organizations, um, such as the World Bank, for instance, because it's a model that allows expansion <laughs> at low cost. So allowing the private sector to mop out uh, the social demand um, and allowing cheaper institutions to take on this new demand and these new audiences accessing higher education um, was a way somehow for many countries um, of meeting social demands without destructuring um, their fairly elite institution that they had established for a very long time. It's the case in Chile, it was the case, it's the case in Nigeria, it's the case in, in many countries around the world where governments but also societies have tried to preserve some um, elite institution where some research was going on uh, while at the same time meeting the social demand and, and meeting the needs of the economy. But this is, um, is this a sustainable uh, system? It's probably not a sustainable system in terms of building a research capacity and building research and development within a country because um, as Carolina was suggesting in her intervention, with a very small pool of research university, the country doesn't necessarily generate the skills re um, required for a fairly autonomous research and development policy. So it is a short-term response to uh, real uh, pressure, actually, from, from outside. And, and we've seen in the case of Chile that they've struggled to handle that pressure because introducing fees into the system to allow this wider um, participation up to 90% has created huge tensions and inequalities and, um, and contributed to um, the, um, the social movement of, of, of on a grand scale that we saw um, 10 years ago. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can we show our appreciation again? Thank you very much, Jan. <laughs> uh,